Hi, I'm Dr. Lauren Spring. And I'm Dr. Sarah Kafashan. And this is My My Favorite Favorite Lesson. Lesson. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to My Favorite Lesson, Season 2. I am Dr. Lauren Spring, and I'm here with my co-host. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Sarah Kafashan. We're so excited to be here today, Lauren. Yes, and we have an extra special guest. We have Jason Bonikowski sitting here in studio with us. Good morning. Good morning, Jason. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. And Jason is, uh, he wears many hats. And one of them <laughs> is a part-time professor um, at Conestoga in our Police Foundations program. Correct. And he's also a police officer. Correct. Do you want to just share your title? You have a, a fancy lung. Sure. I mean, it, it's not super fancy. I'm a detective sergeant with Water Regional Police. I've been there. I'm in my 24th year. Uh, currently, I supervise our human trafficking team, and I'm involved in crisis negotiations as well. Cool. Mm. Yeah. And full disclosure, Jason and I first met because a couple of months ago, we were organizing a symposium, a coordinator and leadership symposium about human trafficking. Yes. And Jason was courteous enough to share his expertise. He was a panelist at the event. And I just thought, wow, yeah. <laughs> I want to learn more from this guy. And uh, this is a great opportunity. Yeah, here we are. Here we are. Yeah. And I met Jason at that same event, but I was in the audience. I was an audience member and I was really uh, intrigued and impressed with, with what you shared, Jason. Cool. So I'm so grateful to have you here today. Well, thank you. So we're going to start just to, you know, just by introducing you a little bit more to mm-hmm. our listeners. So if you can tell us a little bit more about yourself, your time at the college, yeah. um, you know, you talked a little bit about your work in policing as yeah. well and, and how those kind of like decided to kind of intersect. Sure. So I, uh, I mean, I went to Conestoga College as a, as a student back oh. in, I think, 99, 2000. Mm. Uh, so a few years ago now. Uh, so yeah, in as much as policing is concerned, I was hired in 2001 uh, with Water Regional Police. I spent uh, six years in uniform patrol. Uh, following that, I spent uh, a year and a little bit in a plainclothes unit called a target team. Um, we investigated street level criminality within the region. Uh, following that, I moved uh, to our criminal intelligence unit. I worked in our guns and gangs team for about six years, mm-hmm. um, investigating those types of offenses uh, here and elsewhere. Uh, following that, I uh, moved over to our organized crime team, investigate organized crime uh, within the province and elsewhere. Um, following that, I was promoted uh, to sergeant in 2017. Uh, I was sent to a South Division in Cambridge to supervise a, a shift of patrol officers. Um, in October of 2017, I was involved in a critical incident at work that kind of uh, plays into why we're here today, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, struggled with some uh, some significant issues over an 18-month, 24-month period of time that I think we'll discuss. Um, took some time away from work, finally came back in March 2020, and I've been assigned to human trafficking since then. And uh, part of our crisis negotiation team since last uh, last April. And again, my uh, my personal journey through some of my own struggles has uh, parlayed in the crisis negotiation and and connecting with people on on a very grassroots level. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. When you say crisis negotiation, what mm-hmm. what can that look like? So generally, what our uh, crisis negotiations involve is either people in uh, the middle of a mental health crisis, mm. um, or people who have involved uh, in criminality and find themselves uh, in a place where they're, they're unable to cope with their present circumstances, and maybe they don't want to exit their residence and, and face the charges that they have to face, or um, you know, at, at times if there's a hostage situation, then we deal with that as well. So. It's usually people who are under elevated levels of stress for some reason in their life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's intense. Yeah, yeah. it can be. Yeah. <laughs> Just it, another it day at the office. Just <laughs> another day. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. You've been all around the block, hey? All I've, these different specialties and teams with... I've yeah. been very, very fortunate in my career to, to really have a wide array of experiences. Um, the other thing I, I didn't touch on that I was very fortunate to do is do some covert work um, across the country for... Um, around an eight to nine year period of time. So I was involved in some other investigations elsewhere in the country that mm-hmm. uh, as an undercover operator, that was kind of wow. interesting. So yeah, I've had a very uh, a blessed career. I've been very fortunate. Yeah. yeah. It sounds like you love it. I yeah. do. I, I, I love it. And, uh, you know, there's been some unpleasant times like everyone else, else has in their career. Uh, but overall, it, it's really, it's been a great job. Um, the friendships and the connections I've made um, and now, um, you know, it's parlayed into the opportunity to be at the college and, uh, you know, it's a bit of a catchphrase, but to give back, uh, to that next generation of the college is really an empowering, uh, feeling for me. 
Um, and just taking what I've learned, mostly the mistakes I've made along the way and trying mm -hmm. to, you know, instill into others how to avoid some of those pitfalls that I found myself in. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so interested. So w through all of these investigations and all these different, you know, little departments that mm -hmm. you were part of, how did that, you know, coincide with making the decision to come and give back and teach the next generation? Yeah. So I've, uh, I've always enjoyed the aspect of public speaking itself, um, in the different areas of policing I've been involved in. Um, once I've become uh, comfortable with, with the area I've been in, I, I've usually ended up presenting on it in some way, shape or form, mm -hmm. um, whether that's just my annoying personality or I enjoy <laughs> talking and have a hard time shutting up once I start. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's, uh, I knew it was something that I wanted to look at eventually. And actually, uh, the coordinator of the program I'm involved in, Marv Mustin, uh, used to be my sergeant uh, in policing oh, back, I, I think, in, two, in 2004 <laughs> or 2003. Uh, so I had that connection with Marv already, and I knew that he had gone to the college. Um, so as I got later on in my career, I knew it was something I wanted to look at. Um, mm. And it just, yeah, the stars aligned, and here I am. That's fantastic. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more about the courses you teach, which programs mm -hmm. you've taught in, mm -hmm. um, just so that our listeners know a little bit more sure. about that. Yeah. So I've been at the college since September of last year. So um, just under a year now. Um, the first semester I taught an overview on uh, border services in Canada and the correctional system in Canada and what that looks like and um, what the possible job opportunities are um, for students to look at. Uh, it was the last time that course was offered, so I don't think it's on. Uh, it's being offered anymore. Last semester, I taught a surveillance program for our PSI program. Um, we talked about uh, mobile for surveillance, all the different aspects of technical surveillance, and uh, a lot of my investigative experience um, played into that course as well. Um, this semester, I'm teaching a course on criminal investigations. Um, it is an elective course, so it's not part of our police foundations program, but it gives a, essentially an overview of a uh, criminal investigation from its, in, from its inception uh, up into the court process. So Wow. And yeah. have things changed with the program since you were a student at Conestoga? What are some of the... So I'd, honestly, the my memory is going to escape me here. The mm -hmm. I think the, the substance of the program is fairly similar. Um, obviously, the, the demographic of the college has changed significantly with the influx of international students. Um, I think that's been, from my perspective as a professor, it's been really interesting um, because there's just such a wide array and a depth of different backgrounds now that people bring into the classroom. Um, you know, we don't just have people who have grown up in Waterloo Region and have what they know in Waterloo Region. It's we're accepting people from all parts, parts of the globe and they bring such an array of experiences with them that we can draw from and learn from in a classroom setting. So that's been um, really interesting for me. Yeah. Well, yeah. And that's a lot, right? Like that it is already, I would imagine someone who did grow up in this region, mm -hmm. you're learning about all these different laws and yes. kind of practices and, you know, ethics yes. <laughs> of policing and everything. And yeah. so, um, yeah, that would be a, a lot of learning for, for international students who've just arrived here and oh, my goodness. Just yeah. navigating their way through survival. And yeah. And I, I try to, as I'm sure most of us do, I try to put myself in their shoes and, and think like if, if the rules were reversed and I went across the ocean, uh, to their country and tried to assimilate myself into their culture, how difficult would that be for mm -hmm. me? Um, so yeah, I try to give them as much grace as possible. Yeah. Yeah. A nice approach, I'd say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a lovely, you know, a little, a little compassionate teaching there that we, that we, Lauren yeah. and I really like. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So it sounds like with these courses that you teach, mm -hmm. you cover a lot of content and topics that hit close to home mm -hmm. with, with the 24 years that you've been with the police force. Certainly. Yes. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit more about you know, maybe a lesson sure. uh, in one of those courses where you're covering a topic that you have personal or lived mm -hmm. experience with, right? Mm -hmm. And then you're standing up in front of the class teaching it as an expert to these students. Yeah. Um, how has that been for you? When have you chosen, okay, I'm just, I'm deciding right now, I'm going to share more about myself with my right. students versus I do have experience with this, but I'm going to maybe hold back. Yeah. My, and again, uh, this is just my opinion. I, I try really hard to live, uh, in an era of transparency. Um, I don't, I really try not to be someone different, um, depending upon where I'm at. Um, I find that uh, authenticity and transparency go a long way in forming authentic connections with people. 
Um, most of the lesson plans, uh, when it comes down to the, the the criminal substance or the policing substance, I, I usually have an anecdote for each lesson that I can draw from. And that's just, I've been fortunate to be involved in a lot of different investigations. Um, but more so what I, I've found um, for me, um, sharing some some raw personal details of my life, um, some less pleasant than others, have mm. formed some real true connections with the yeah. students um, and has allowed them to see that I'm no one special. I may be standing in front of you up here in the classroom, but I'm a flawed human like everybody else. And that's a beautiful thing. So for me personally, I touched on uh, being involved in a critical incident at work in 2017 uh, without going into salacious detail. Um, I was involved in an incident uh, that resulted in the death of two people. Um, had a really, really tough time uh, dealing with everything around that mentally. Um, for 18 months, um, I dove down the rabbit hole of uh, PTSD um, and substance abuse, um, and eventually morphing into full-blown addiction. Um, and then finally uh, was arrested during that time uh, mm -hmm. for, for impaired driving. Um, so was arrested, um, eventually was suicidal. Um, and it was only a last, a last ditch effort by close family and friends that kind of um, saved my life. And I ended up uh, attending treatment, inpatient treatment on the West Coast uh, for 63 days for trauma and addiction back in 2019, January 2nd, 2019. Um, so that uh, those kind of 18 months for me um, was the scariest portion of my life and almost cost me my life. But the beautiful part of it is it morphed me into a better version of myself that I never would have known otherwise. Um, and since that time, um, worth where I'm at in my recovery, um, because I'm very comfortable with who I am and with where my life path has taken me, I'm very open and transparent about um, what I've gone through in the hopes that others can avoid some of those pitfalls. Um, so again, each semester, when I look at the lesson plan, um, I am obviously fluid with it, um, but I try to pick out a point where I think, okay, this makes sense for me to share my background. Mm -hmm. um, and, and usually I'll allude to it at the start of the semester that, you know, this is my background. Um, I talk about open source queries and how I like to know um, who I'm meeting. And, mm. you know, maybe you want to Google your professor to see <laughs> what. And I try to drop those little hints to see. Um, and it's funny because people will come up in week two or week three and be like, hey, is, is that you in this article? Because mm. there's articles about me. I'm like, yeah, yeah. that's me. See, I've made mistakes. Um, and then at some point uh, within the semester, we we talk about it. Um, and usually what I do or what I have done that, that I've found to be pretty powerful um, is I've I've put it out there to them and be like, what are you doing to better prepare yourselves uh, in the future for traumatic events? What mm. healthy coping mechanisms can we establish now so that when things do go south, we have a plan in place? Because what happened to me is my one and only healthy coping mechanism that I thought I had established was taken away from me. And mm. after that, all I had to fall back on was the negative coping mechanisms yeah. I've been building up over the years what was that it was your job to yeah, for, for me the the healthy coping mechanism that i thought i had established was fitness mm -hmm. um but quickly after my um critical incident um and the ptsd symptoms I, I was afraid to leave my house i couldn't leave my house um you know i i lived under a table in the basement for three months because it was the only place i felt safe um and there's a wide array of other things going on um but my one coping mechanism that was fitness was now taken away from me. Mm -hmm. uh, so all I had to fall back on was some of the negative things, um, even uh, unknowingly I'd been building up, which for me was initially alcohol uh, and then pharmaceutical medication and eventually opiates as well. Um, so yeah, it was, uh, it was quite a wild ride, but here we are. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much for sharing that. No, Jason. Of course. It's <laughs> such rich information. And I mean, I want to pick up on a couple of strands. Like, first mm -hmm. of all, you said, you know, I share all these stories with my students and, you know, just to let them know I'm nothing special. Yeah. And I really like beg to differ there. <laughs> Adding your specialty. Yeah. <laughs> because, you know, we know from the research and we know anecdotally, um, Lauren and I interact with a lot of professors. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult, especially for novice mm -hmm. professors um, to share you know, these parts of ourselves that we yeah. may not necessarily want everyone to know. Sure. It's really easy to share all the accomplishments and sure. all the ways we've shined when we're standing in front of the room and we've yeah. got 
30, 40 students looking up at us right, yep. as experts. Um, but we know from the research that when faculty strategically disclose these times in their lives that mm-hmm. help them grow, mm-hmm. help them get through these parts of the job and, you know, the, the career that they've mm-hmm. chosen that the students are so eager to get into, that's when the students really connect. Yes. Yeah. Right. And, and it's great to hear, like, you know, I'm not surprised to hear that the students like, like really hear that with you as well. Yeah. And it just, for me, you know, it goes back to, to Brene Brown and the power of vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Um, if you have, and and you exist in authentic vulnerability, it's really hard for anyone to question you because you have nothing that you're hiding. Everything is on the table and, and, and you accept, um, you know, your mistakes from the past or not mistakes, uh, your inappropriate decisions from the past, but then show that, you are learning from them uh, and, and growing. And yet I'd say it's still rare and refreshing when you encounter it, right? You can yes. feel it. It's almost visceral when you're it is. communicating with somebody. It's so powerful. <laughs> yeah. It's, and again, just that authenticity and that transparency and that like, here I am a wonderfully flawed human, like everybody else. Um, and that's okay. Mm-hmm. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I first, just like you you encourage your students to do, I first encountered your story right. on the Waterloo. I think it's on the Waterloo police site, yeah. right? Like yep. there's, um, and was really impressed again with that vulnerability, with that authenticity mm-hmm. behind it. And also just with the courage that it takes, right? And I, I mean, this is, we hear a lot about policing culture, mm-hmm. it certainly has a kind of like masculine sure sort does. of, you yeah, know, a certain a brand of, it. yeah. Yep. Um, Associated with the culture. Yeah. And I would imagine vulnerability is a challenge for a lot of folks. In sure that. it is. <laughs> in yeah. that. Was that part of the decision? Like, obviously you, you've said, wait, I've, you know, I've come out the other side of this mm-hmm. really harrowing time. Mm-hmm. I've learned some things about myself. I want to live in the world in this authentic way. Mm-hmm. Is sharing your story also partially to encourage others to say, hey, it's okay. Listen, yes. like the police force has my back. This is on their website. This yeah. Is, yeah. yeah. So it's something I've been, again, very fortunate to do is for the last three, three and a half years, every new recruit class that comes through uh, our service, they hear my story. I do a presentation um, on my story um, and we talk about wellness and we talk about resiliency and we talk about coping mechanisms and we talk about the career and and how it can happen. And we talk about not letting the job become your identity. Because again, for me, I had I was so engrossed with with the job and especially certain aspects of my job that when again my job was taken away from me, I had built my identity to in to being the police officer mm-hmm. or to be in the cop or to be in the undercover guy. Um, and that was taken away from me. And then I felt like I had no identity and I just felt like I was lost. Um, so, and as important as it is for our police officers to, to grab onto this career as a, as a passion, almost, um, it can't be the most important thing in their life. Um, it just can't be because at the end of the day, um, you know, if any of us win Lotto Max this weekend, we're probably not going to come back to work <laughs> as much as oh, we, we like it. Oh, we still be podcasting. Well, you'd be sure, you, yeah. just, just from a beach time. in Turks and Caicos, <laughs> probably, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Very possibly. Yes. <laughs> when you think back to yourself as a student, mm-hmm. um, did you have access to anything like that? Any? No. 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 no uh, even when I started in policing, um, it, it, we did not have discussions about mental yeah. health or PTSD or trauma or resiliency, it just, it wasn't there. Um, and it wasn't talked about. No, no conversations about self-care either. Hey, about no. how we know, understandably, this field is going to be difficult no. and probably especially difficult for students who are just getting in there. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. I mean, yeah, if we can establish or even start having the conversations at a college level before they even get into the profession and if they can see, um, and again, I, I'm, I'm no one special, but if they can see someone who's done the job, um, has had their struggles in the job, but then has come back on the other side and has a bit to share and offer. Like if we can, we can build that, you know, little initial resiliency in them in college and hopefully we get them a fighting chance. Yeah. And I mean, I think of this from the perspective of policing, of course, mm-hmm. right? If you're setting the stage and saying, listen, sure. it's not a matter of if, but when yes. you're going to have a difficult, yes. <laughs> yeah. really difficult interaction at work. Yep. Um, but I imagine even just, 
you know, as students, right? Mm -hmm. If they find themselves in dark times, even before they become a police officer and and have some sort of critical incident, right? just the, this having a model of someone who's up there in front of the room saying, Hey, I was in this dark place. Yeah. And, And I mean, again, for our international students, especially in my opinion, uh, it can be so hard because there's so much isolation um, mm-hmm. with being new to the country, being new to the region, being new to the college, being new to the entire experience um, and, and probably struggling economically at times. Um, there's not a lot of places for them to turn. So, um, you know, the old adage, knowledge is power. If we can at least give them as much knowledge as possible um, to help them out, I think we owe them that. Um, it's not enough, in my opinion, for us to to open our doors to the country and the region and then say, good luck. Mm-hmm. Um, if we're opening doors, then we have a duty and responsibility to, to hold some hands until they get established, in my opinion. And would yeah. you, given that you didn't have necessarily that as part of your training, mm-hmm. when, and you know, you loved your job, you're clearly super yep. capable, like <laughs> really passionate. Yeah. And then this, just a series of events, right? Mm-hmm. This kind of simple, <laughs> yep. whatever transpired. Did you find yourself maybe not in the moment? Cause it's hard when you're in the thick of it, but mm-hmm. you know, would you ever have anticipated yourself when you were a student that you could go down this path or that? Never. No, I, I absolutely had um, the misconception that I was Teflon and bulletproof. I, 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 in my mind, I had seen a lot of, and have been involved in a lot of tough situations at work and unpleasantness at work. Mm-hmm. Um, and I didn't, in my mind, I thought if I haven't been rattled by now, um, it's not going to happen. Um, and then it did. Mm-hmm. And I was not prepared. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious about, you know, what led you to go into policing Yeah, and kind of those expectations versus the reality of the job and now sure. the 24 years of experience. Because I think that's something that, you know, like you said, students go into something expecting one thing. Like mm-hmm. you said, you expecting, oh, I'm not going to get rattled. And yep. then it does happen. Yep. Um, and, you know, I think most people who've been in it would know. Yes. Right? Yeah. yeah. So, so what led you to policing and, and how were your expectations as, you know, a first year student? Sure. Compared uh, to the, re- the reality. So for me, it's, it's a bit of a simple answer. What led me to policing was my father. Uh, he was a police officer with Water Regional Police for 32 years uh, before me. So. Um, very much emulated him, looked mm-hmm. up to him, loved um, the profession, and that was kind of all I wanted to do. Um, I didn't really have a plan B, which in reflection probably wasn't the best idea, <laughs> uh, but all my eggs were definitely in this basket. So um, I thought I had a good idea of what the job was. Having said that, um, that was based on my dad's stories from the 80s and 90s. Um, mm-hmm. so maybe once somewhat I, censored. Maybe <laughs> somewhat <laughs> censored and, and when things were done a little differently. So once right. I, I got into the college and, and started to, you know, experience the first and second year of, of Conestoga. And then when I got into policing, I, I quickly realized there's there's a lot more to it than just the fun stories that dad shared. Um but an interesting component to to kind of my struggle with being off work was the last six years that my dad was a police officer. Um, he was he had cancer throughout those years, mm. um, but he kept going to work right up until uh, the end when he passed away. So um, for me, as a teenager, I saw my dad go to work um, really, really sick with cancer. Fast forward, you know, 20, 25 years later, whatever it was, here I was sitting at home and I couldn't go to work. But it wasn't because I had cancer. It wasn't right. because my leg was broken. Yeah. It wasn't. It was because I couldn't control my own brain. Right. So for me, it became really hard because I was like, "You saw your dad go to work with cancer, mm-hmm. but you're scared to leave your house. Like, what is mm-hmm. wrong with you?" Yeah. Um. So it was. Uh, it was interesting. Not at the time. It's interesting now to to mm-hmm. look back and see how that played into things. Um. But yeah. Uh, a very short answer to your question. My dad. My dad is yeah. the reason I became a cop. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, this piece is, is, is interesting as well, because there's, I'm sure a stronger narrative, like you're sharing in, mm-hmm. in, in policing in certain disciplines, but around the world, right. Mm-hmm. Where we're kind of quote, a mental health thing is, is, you know, not as severe right. as, as, as a physical thing. Yes. Right. And yet we know that not just police officers, but police officers, firefighters, paramedics, yeah. PTSD is huge yes. in those areas. Right. Yeah. And, and it's, it's a necessity yes. to talk about it, right? And, Agreed. And 
Yeah, I guess my heart feels tender thinking about you having your first experience and maybe mm. haven't heard of those things, mm -hmm. right? And and haven't been exposed to that yeah. um, before. And and I can imagine, you know, the kind of self talk that I would have right. if I were in your position, right? Yeah. yeah. And was the um, treatment program that you sought out on the West Coast specifically for first responders military? Or? So it was. I was really fortunate. The uh, it was called Edgewood Health Network. It's in the Nimo on Vancouver Island. Um, the, the, uh, facility itself, uh, is not, uh, all for first responders and military, but there is a separate component that had just been created about six months previous to me going, um, that was strictly for first responders or people in the military. Mm -hmm. Um, so for that, it, it gave, because I wasn't where I'm at now in my journey, it gave me, uh, what felt like a safer place, um, with people that I could connect to, um, to get better, um. But what ended up happening really, um, which was really, really powerful for me is when I was at the treatment center, we would be integrated with the quote unquote normal, normal addicts, <laughs> whatever you want to call. Um, but these were people that earlier on in my career, especially when I was younger, um, that I really would have treated poorly and I would have looked down upon. Yeah. And now here I was a couple decades later, um, no different than any of them. And the interesting part to me was none of them cared that I was a cop. None of them cared about all the cool quote unquote stuff I'd done or the mistakes I made. I was just another sick person trying to get better that everyone brought into their circle. And it was another moment in my journey where I was like, wow, like this is this raw human connection is so powerful. And while my profession is incredibly important, important, um, and it's something I love to do. Like it is, it is not the end all and be all. Mm -hmm. Um, if we can intermix human connection within, you know, policing and within teaching and all these, these, um, professions that exist because of human connection. Um, mm -hmm. it, yeah, that was one of the first moments in treatment for me where I was like, wow, like you throughout your life, you have treated people less well than you should have at different times. Um, it, that's so, I mean, revelatory mm -hmm. and makes me think of it. My doctoral research was with military vets mm -hmm. who had been diagnosed with PTSD. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that, you know, we ended up working on this concept called moral injury and just right. this, one of the things that they realized usually when they got in theater, like they were actually, you know, they were all from and had participated in the war in Afghanistan, but mm -hmm was like, wait, this narrative that I've been sold about the good guys and the bad guys is yeah. so much more nuanced than that. Yes. And that's a fault in the education system because yes. now I'm here yeah. and I, I, these categories are mixing in my head and mm -hmm. maybe I'm not the good guy. Like, do you find that what you learned in that treatment center and those human connections you had, mm -hmm. has this now informed, do you police differently? When yes. You're, yeah. <laughs> yes. I, I live my life differently. I police differently. Um, I, uh, without question, I can say that at different times in my career previous to 2017, um, I, without question acted with a sense of bravado at times mm -hmm. or without question acted, um, uh, with a, with a sense of superiority because of, of the fact that I was a police officer in any uniform. And there are still times when that needs to happen. That is the reality of the job. Uh, having said that now, um, I will be on calls with people and depending upon what the call is and, and whether or not I'm, I'm establishing a rapport with someone, um, I have the unique ability to tell someone, Google my name. Mm -hmm. Like you take five minutes right now while I'm here, Google my name, read about me. I'm no one special. Mm -hmm. I've made a whole bunch of mistakes. Um, and, and once you read that, then hopefully you'll see that this is a job. It's a very important job, but I'm a flawed human under this uniform. I'm just like you. Um, I just happened to be given a few opportunities in life that others weren't, or else I would be on the other side of the equation. Yeah. I, I could very, very easily have, have, you know, ended up homeless on the street. I really could have. Yeah. I just, I just had different opportunities than other people did. Yeah. That's the reality. That, that's such a powerful perspective. And I mean, you know, so my training is in psychology mm -hmm. and I felt like this is what I learned like in my undergrad, I remember going through like human development right. courses and learning about quote, protective factors and risk factors that would lead to people to these life situations. Yeah. And remember thinking like, wow, if 
there was a slight mm-hmm. tweak yep. in, you know, what the universe delivered to me. Yep. Right. Like yeah. I could be on that route. Yeah. Someone I loved who I really admire, who had all these opportunities is so successful, could have been on that yeah. route. And that's just such a, a different perspective to take when you walk around the world. Right. Right. Yeah. And I'm so curious to know in your training, mm-hmm. you know, I know you learn about complex populations in, in, in policing training, mm-hmm. right? Cause you, you're going to be working with them, but like, like I'm wondering what narrative or what, what lessons did you learn in your training about people that you would be interacting with? Mm-hmm. So I think the lessons that I would have learned 20, um, whatever that would have been 25 years ago or 24 years ago in, in college and in at the Ontario police college. Again, this is my opinion. We looked at things. We, we looked at more at people from an officer safety standpoint, like what can people do to hurt you and how do we mitigate that um, when we're dealing with people, which again is a very important aspect of the job. Our, our safety is paramount. Um, having said that, in my opinion, we didn't really talk about um, looking at the layers to a person um, because oftentimes, and I don't have to tell either of you this, um, the, today's behavior usually isn't happening because something happened right in that moment. Right. Usually mm-hmm. there's things that lead up to that behavior happening. Yeah. So if we can tear away those initial layers and look at, okay, what got us, we're here today, but what got us here? Um, whereas in the past, I feel like it was very much like, okay, we're here today and we're going to solve this right now. Yeah. Um, because we like, this is what we're doing. Um, and I think now we're seeing things, um, it's very much, okay, what got us to here today and how are we helping to solve this? Um, a very short anecdote in our use of force training, um, if someone was holding a knife or we went through scenarios, very much be yelling at them, drop the knife, drop mm-hmm. the knife, drop the knife, drop the knife. We've now come to learn that, okay, if you say drop the knife three times and they don't do it, they're probably not going to. So then why don't we try something different? Like, mm-hmm. hey, what's your name? Hey, how mm-hmm. can I help you? Mm-hmm. What What's going on today? Let's talk about this. Whereas in the past, it were very much authoritarian, like drop it, drop it, drop it. Mm-hmm. Right. But now it's like, no, let's understand that something happened to get this person to this point today. Can we key on that and talk about that? And we can still get the same we desired still, results. We can. Even more better. Gentle. Yeah, yeah, a little yeah. gentler. And that's, yeah. yeah, like that's okay. Well, and yeah. I recall, because I was, I was part of a, a kind of role play scenario with mm-hmm. the policing program about a year ago. And I remember, I mean, I came in, it was like a pedagogical sure. thing. Like, how does this work? Okay, I'll step in and learn a little bit. But I was this character that was sort of, you know, she was having some sort of manic episode and had stolen a, a wrench or something yeah. from someone's shed and just walking in the dark. And and part of it was improvised. Sure. And at one point, one of the officers in training kind of said, why do you have that? And I said, oh, just to protect myself in case. And then suddenly that could result in a charge, right? right. Yeah. Whereas if someone had just <laughs> asked differently, like yeah. then that character wouldn't actually be right. charged with, I forget what it was, possession of a Weapons weapon. Weapons dangerous or, yeah. or something mm-hmm. like that. Yeah. yeah. And it's just, you could, I, it struck me in that moment, just mm-hmm. like how you have those conversations yeah. with people in distress yep. has real legal implications yeah. for yeah, them really and follow up. Yeah. Like, yeah. And how you approach those conversations, right? right? Cause like, what you're saying is very much in line with how I think about things, which is, you know, you can look at a certain population. You might say, quote, addicts are more likely to mm-hmm. whatever, right? Fill in the blank. Yep. And really, that's just a picture of the moment. Yes. But we're all movies, yes. for lack of metaphor, right? Like yes. we're all, there's all the backstory that led to that moment. Yeah. And when you're just looking at the picture, all you see is that moment, right? right? And the defiance and the law right. breaking, but you don't ask what happened? Right. Right. And how did society maybe contribute and fail? Right. Not just this person, but many of us. Well, it's so true. And we, we, you know, we, we take our experiences and that shapes our perspective. You know, if I'm driving down the street at midnight and I see someone, you know, in dark clothing on a bicycle, to me, I think based on my policing experience, oh, that person could be doing ABC. Mm -hmm. Similarly, if I'm involved in someone who's in crisis that hates the police, Okay, well, what's happened in their life to make them distrust the police? Probably, maybe, maybe something legitimate has happened, maybe not, but let's give them grace and and think that, okay, they've had some bad experiences with police officers. All their uniforms look the same. Mm -hmm. When you're in a mental health crisis, you're not going to remember whose name was on a uniform. You're just going to see the uniform. Um, So again, if we can recognize that things are, are life experiences 
dictate how we perceive our current events, then again, if we give people more grace, I think that can go a long way. And then if you're the officer arriving on scene and you have that right. sort of sensitivity, you know you also have the power in that moment to help shift that narrative, right? Yes. You can either reinforce what they already think about police officers and the fear that's yes. Yeah, yes. yeah latent, once once or... you've established rapport, you can influence behavior. Yeah. yeah. But you have to and, and in again, in my opinion, the rapport can't um can't be false. It has to be an authentic rapport. And then you know when you when you feel that with someone. Mm -hmm. And then yeah, you can hopefully start to influence the behavior a little bit. So one of the things that Sarah and I are fascinated about, and part of the reason behind this research in this podcast, mm -hmm. is that we really feel like complex lived experiences are a huge asset. Yes. That and I can see it. I can when I hear you talk, yeah. uh, when I've seen you in action, even at the human trafficking symposium part of the panel, right? We had right. someone with lived experience where the trauma was still very visceral mm -hmm. for them. We mm -hmm. had other folks at the, the women's sexual assault network. You have this ability to connect with people, to give space to, I can see how what you've gone through makes you more, more and more brilliant at what you do. Thank you. And yet sometimes, you know, and we've, we've worked with folks, you know, in social work, social services, if mm -hmm. they've admitted to having some sort of mental health crisis, yeah. whatever, there are regulating bodies that then say, you're not fit necessarily, or now you could be a risk. Yeah. And we find that really tricky territory, right? Yes. Because mm -hmm. you see like this, this is makes me what, you know, is so good at what I do. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. now, it, yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you, if you, you know, get the help that's out there and you essentially harness what you've been through, it's a super um, power. Like, it, it, yeah, it can just give you the, this innate ability to, to, again, in my opinion, connect with people on, on such a grassroots level because it's real. It's real. And you just say, here are my faults. Here's, here's my bad decisions along the way. Here's how I'm trying to do better. Let's all learn from it and recognize that it's okay to not be okay. It's okay to have bad days. Have you ever felt yourself in a place or a moment or a particular room where it didn't feel safe to share mm, your story or, yeah. or all parts of it. Yeah. I've had a few experiences, um, um, in the human trafficking uh, world. We, we work with a lot of community partners, um, and they are all fantastic. Um, they all don't share the same, um, values that, that we do, um, which again can be really important at coming together at a table because there are a lot of different perspectives. Um, however, some people, not a lot by any means, but some people, um, have choose to kind of weaponize, um, what I've gone through, um, mm -hmm. to throw kind of jabs, um, my way, um, at, at, at me and at the profession and, and which is fine. Again, the person who I am today, um, based on all the help I've got, I can kind of see through that, not take it personally and recognize mm -hmm. that. Okay. Like I, I, I kind of, I know what you're doing here. Mm -hmm. Um, you're just making noise and that's okay. Um, you know, nothing about me. So you're, this is not you're not mad at me or you're not, you're not targeting me. Um, so I, uh, there are times when I, I have felt less comfortable than others sharing my story, but, um, again, I'm not trying to sound self-righteous or dramatic, but I've, I've kind of made a commit commitment to myself that, that I am a open book mm -hmm. and I'm going to continue to live that way. Um, if people don't like me, that's very okay. Mm -hmm. Not everyone has to like me. I'm okay mm -hmm. with that but I'm going to keep being who I am um, without apology. Another component of that is, and I don't know if it's maybe my background in theater and mm -hmm. I just am a little bit obsessed with kind of how we tell stories. Sure. And yeah. It's stuck out to me when you said, you know, if you're teaching a bunch of new recruits sort mm -hmm. of in actually like police force already, you'll share your story at the start yeah. with your students in class you kind of the first class hint at it and say, go off and Google, yeah. come back. We're going to talk more about it. I'll let, I'll let more parts of yep. my background out yep. as time goes on. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be like a deliberate choice, whether yes. intuitive or, yep. you know, or rational. Um, yeah. Why do you think like, why in one environment would you maybe slowly piece things together for students or ask them to do a bit of the groundwork versus. Yeah. Yeah. So again, uh, whether it's right or not, uh, it, my, my perspective on it is at Conestoga, um, the students are coming into an unknown environment. They don't really know what the teacher is going to be like. They don't know what the course material is going to be like. They don't know what the other students in the classroom, what's the dynamic going to be like. Um, so I, I don't want 
to overwhelm them right off the start with be like, Hey, here's me. I'm going <laughs> to, here's my story. Read it, jam it down your throat. Let's all be vulnerable. Right. Um, for me, it's let's take a couple, um, a couple weeks, get to know each other a little better, let you know that, you know, the, the class environment is, is as relaxed for still professional, but as relaxed as we can have it. Um, let's, you know, again, get to know each other on a first name basis, talk about some stories and then when it's right. Um, and then we'll, I'll share mine. Um, with the recruits and policing, um, again, in my opinion, like at this stage in the game, they know what they're walking into. They know the job they're walking into. They don't know all the complexities of it, but they know um, the parameters of the job. Um, and this, th they could go out in their first shift and walk into a chaotic crime scene that mm -hmm. could turn the world upside down. Um, so in my opinion, it is important that off right out of the gate, we talk about mental health, we talk about resiliency, we talk about coping mechanisms, we talk about the fact that you're going to have bad days. That's going to happen. You're going to change as a person over time. Your family is going to see you change. Um, be careful about putting up invisible barriers between yourself and your family. You know, it's very easy for mm -hmm. police officers to go like, you don't understand. You don't know what I went through because you weren't there. Mm -hmm. um, so again, for me, I remind them like, yes, your family isn't there with you on those hard calls, but they're there when you get home and they see that you're a different person and they see that you've changed. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why, again, in my opinion, um, the two areas are a little different um, because there's so many unknowns to the students, especially our international students. Um, there could be language barriers, there could be cultural barriers, there could be society, um, socioeconomic barriers. Um, and our police recruits, it's like, okay, you're here. You mm -hmm. wanted this, you've gone through the process, buckle up. Right. Um, yeah, <laughs> let's go. Uh, so that's kind of my reasoning behind it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and in either case, like, I mean, I find so much when we talk about higher education, mm -hmm. we tend to focus on like the cognitive, right? Do right. you know the mm -hmm. laws? Do you know the protocols, yeah. et cetera? Right. What's the first step in a crime scene? Right. And in some cases, I guess in policing too, psychomotor, can you handcuff someone? Sure. Like, you know, yeah. And so often the affective domain mm -hmm. is ignored, right? And right. it's there, like it's obviously going to show up for people. Yes. But how did that feel to handcuff a person right now? And mm -hmm. I mean, right. I could talk about feelings all day. That yes. <laughs> yeah. You don't want me teaching in your program, but, um, you know, I'm really glad to hear you bringing some of that in, even if it's not explicitly, mm -hmm. you know, in the unit outcomes or whatever, right. it's... It's there. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and again, um, I usually try to do it closer to the start of the semester so that we can just, we have that bond. Um, and it's the, the first time I did it in my first semester, I didn't, I talked to my, my girlfriend who's also uh, teaches at the college and, uh, I'm like, I don't know if I should do this. I don't know how it's going to be received. Um, but I couldn't, I couldn't believe the responses I got back and how, I would bet 60 to 70% of the students were so vulnerable in, in sharing their own struggles and especially sharing their struggles that they've had since um, they've come to our country and into our region about how difficult it is. And I thought like, wow, I never would have had these connections with the students had I not shared mm -hmm. my story. Um, and, and yeah, I'm like the, that to me, I'm like, even, and again, you know, hate to, I don't know the right word is here. Um, but uh, even if it does help one person, like even if it does help one student, then that's that's a win. And even mm -hmm. if it's not immediate, right? It's, if it's yeah. not it's immediate, like planting seeds. Maybe that's twenty fine. years from right. now, this person's yeah. gonna remember. Yeah, yeah. like uh, you know, I have tattoos on my head. I'm hard to forget. So <laughs> if, if they remember the tattooed head professor that said some things, then awesome. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'm gonna backtrack a little because I'm so fascinated with. Um, professions that have this bravado mm -hmm. right in them and then the mental health aspect sure. and i'd love to know like when you were first on the job mm -hmm. as a police like what kind of training did you get in mental health i assume it's mostly um supporting folks with mental health as opposed to your own it sounds yeah. like there was no training for what to do with your own yeah it was pretty minimal in nature um again it's been a few years for me but i I really don't remember talking about mental health at the police college. Um, I can remember a really um, a, a traumatic call a few months after um, I got hired and again, without going into detail, um, I remember how we coped with that call after, and it was not at all talking about how it affected us or mental health. Right. It was just focusing on the person and drinking like yeah. that. Mm -hmm. That's what we did. You and yeah. those involved in yeah. the call. Yeah. Yes. yeah. yeah. Um, that's yeah. how we dealt with it. Um, so it was, uh, it was more to your point. Yeah. We, we talked about dealing with people in mental health crisis, but I feel like even back then, the, again, back in 2001, 
Um, we weren't peeling back the layers of why someone was in a mental health crisis. Right. It was strictly like, that's the behavior and this is how you deal with that behavior when you see it. As yeah. opposed to like, no, let's find out why this behavior is existing. Yeah. What Again, what got us to this point. And it's so interesting because, you know, I've, I've worked in the realm of mental health mm-hmm. training and, you know, we're, we're picking up on this missed like opportunity for one key aspect, right? Which is like, if you, if you teach and, and it's still helpful to know mm-hmm. how to, to navigate a mental health crisis, how sure. to support someone. But if you just look on that, that is the narrative that would bring into context what you talked about when you were on the East, uh, right. on the West coast, yeah. right. Of like, here I am right, right. beside people that I would have looked at very differently, yes. interacted with very differently, thought about, yeah, yeah, criminalized, made bad in my head. Yep. And a training like that is kind of contributing in some ways to sure that narrative, is. right? And, yeah. And yeah, not human. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it really is. And then conversely, again, what I've found in sharing my story is that it, in a, where I felt connected to those people in treatment because they didn't look down on me or didn't judge me for anything, um, similarly, I, I feel like once I peel off my professional layers for the students and let them know that again, like I'm a flawed human, here's, here's my story, please read it. Mm-hmm. Um, they're like, okay, he's not like the, the cop that's talking to me at the front of the room. He's, he's a guy who's made his, a world of mistakes, um, and is trying to do better. But I, I feel I'm more quote unquote, one of them, mm-hmm. um, because they know me, they, yeah. they know all my, all my skeletons in the closet. There are none because mm-hmm. they're on the table. So now let's learn because now we know it's a safe environment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Would do you think, I don't know if this is a, like across Canada or across the province question, but clearly there's some leadership within mm-hmm. your police force mm-hmm. that says, Hey, it's important. These new recruits yes. you know, hear Jay's story. And it's important that we let him yeah. celebrate this part of his journey yes. openly. Yes. Is that yeah. like, is police culture shifting towards that? Would you mm-hmm. say in the country or? I would definitely, <laughs> yeah, I would say within the last five years, especially uh, the culture is shifting. Um, I think that's part and parcel to um, kind of the younger generation getting into more senior leadership roles. Mm-hmm. Um, and the fact that some people who were solidified in those positions had the old kind of suck it up mentality, deal with it and move on. Um, I think the the newer generation recognizes uh, the work we need to do in the mental health um, area of policing and first responders in general. Um, so yeah, I do. And I think the new officers that we're now hiring, the, the really young officers, they're, uh, they're coming into the job already um, well aware of mental health. Um, mm-hmm. It's talked about in schools a lot more than we the ever. Language for yeah. it. Yeah. Right. Um, so I think it's not abnormal to them to talk about it. Whereas when I came into the profession as a 20 year old, it was very abnormal. Like Mm -hmm. I, I never would have said like, Oh, I'm feeling sad today or I'm that call bothered me. Like Mm -hmm. I never would have said that. Um, so I think again, we're same as in the classroom, we're hopefully creating a safe place for, for officers to be like, Hey, that, that bothered me. Okay, let's talk about it. And that's actually a sign of strength. Right. Yeah. Yes. That, that's, yeah. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, we're almost at our time. Yeah. Unfortunately. I, yeah. have, I have one more question. <laughs> sure. Do you have another question too, sir? Um, you go first. Okay. I'm still formulating. I'm curious. So having had this experience in policing for mm-hmm. many, many years, now teaching at Conestoga, also clearly teaching uh, new recruits mm-hmm. within policing. Are there any key similarities between good policing and good teaching? I think mm. communication is, is the biggest one. Um, there are, uh, especially when we wear our uniforms at work, you know, we have, we have so many different tools of the trade on them, so to speak, uh, mm. to deal with people in use of force situations. Um, but again, especially through, uh, my work in covert operations as an undercover operator, every single success I had was because of reportability and connecting with people. Mm. Um, that was at the basis for every level of success I've had, um, in crisis negotiations, um, if we are not able to build a rapport with someone, then we will not be successful. It's just that simple. We will never come to a successful conclusion um, if we don't have a rapport built with someone. So again, in the classroom, in my opinion, um, if it is just a professor standing at the front of the room lecturing to people and and talking information points at people, um, it's very surface level. Um, but if you actually take the time initially to build a rapport with your students and to establish that personal connection, then probably the material that you're presenting is going to be absorbed better because there's that connection between 
um, the two of you or the group of you. Um, again, as, as opposed to just me talking, here's the mm -hmm. material, next slide, next slide. Um, so yeah, I would say, uh, the, the two, the biggest key point between the two professions is communication and rapport building. I love that. I mean, it's interesting too, when you talk about the tools of policing that mm -hmm. can be mm -hmm. threatening or intimidating sure. to some, there is that inherent power dynamic and not quite to the extreme, no, maybe, no, but, there, <laughs> but there's a, you know, yeah. you hold as a professor, a lot of control yeah. over students' grades and, yep. and, and yeah, yeah, what their future looks like in some ways that, that, yep. you know, I've never liked when professors wield that power. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. And, and, um, and yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, if someone, if you have students who are, are you know, a, a little more disruptive than others, then again, people have been in this profession far longer than I have. But I found that if I take that five minutes to be like, hey, what's up? Mm -hmm. Like, what's going on? Um, there's usually a reason why, why they're acting in that, in that way. And it usually mm -hmm. doesn't have to do with, well, I don't like you as a teacher. It's right. usually something's going on in their yeah. life. Um, yeah. 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 Well, um, since this podcast is called my favorite lesson, right. we have a last closing question that okay. we ask all our, our wonderful guests. And basically it's, as you continue to do this work, you mm -hmm. know, bringing in your lived experience and personal experiences into teaching. Mm -hmm. What's one or two things that you've learned about teaching emotionally complex topics yeah. that has stuck with you that you would like to reiterate or share further with with folks? Uh, again, this is just my um, my opinion. Um, but if you if you are comfortable in in being vulnerable with your students, whatever that looks like for you, not everyone is going to have as salacious mm -hmm. as a story as I have. Um, but if you're comfortable being vulnerable with your students and forming those connections, um, I feel like a, the, the material you're presenting is going to be absorbed better. Um, but B again, and I'm not trying to sound dramatic or self-righteous, but I, I do feel that our, our duty to the students doesn't necessarily end when the lesson plan ends, mm -hmm. especially for our international students. Um, I've seen a few times where we may be their only um, point of stability in the region. We may be the only person they know or trust or to, can come to for questions uh, about jobs or the community mm -hmm. or what have you. So um, I think it's really important to let them know that you're not only there presenting material, but you're there to help them along their, their path as long as you're a part of their life. Mm -hmm. um, because... Again, with our international students, there's so much isolation um, and that can be such a scary place to live in. Um, so I think if they know that, hey, like I'm I'm here to help you. I'm not just here to help you learn the material, but I'm, I'm here to help you assimilate into this community as best we can. I think we owe that to them. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that answered your question. Oh, but completely. Okay. <laughs> yeah, completely. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jason. You're welcome. For, Thanks, Jay. Thanks yeah. for having me. Yeah. For sharing all of this and, and sharing more about yourself. And, of course. And all these wonderful lessons that you've learned. Yeah, well, this has been so cool. Thank you for having It'll me on. Serving your community in many, many ways. Yeah, so. it's, it's awesome. I'm <laughs> yeah. super stoked I get to do it. Well, we've come to the end of another episode of My Favorite Lesson, a podcast hosted by Teaching and Learning at Conestoga. You can find other episodes in this series and more by visiting Teaching and Learning at Conestoga College on YouTube and by following My Favorite Lesson on Spotify. Subscribe to be notified each time a new episode becomes available. And for 24-7 support for all things teaching and learning related, please check out our faculty learning hub at tlconestoga.ca. And with that, I'm Dr. Lauren Spring. And I'm Dr. Sarah Kafashan. And we'll see you next time.